Our guest speaker today is a national broadcaster and he's a household name. He's the man with his finger on the pulse uh, and keeps us informed on practically every aspect of modern Irish society, but he has a significant interest in Irish history. And so we are very, very uh, proud to, to welcome Joe Duffy. Eight days before the Easter Rising began, on April 24th, 1916, Christopher Kit Carroll, a 21-year-old member of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers from Church Street in Dublin, was killed near Benvilliers on the Somme in northern France. He was my granduncle, who along with his own uncle, Tom Kavanagh, had walked a few hundred yards from the tenement room where they lived in 89 Church Street in Dublin to the nearby Linen Hall Barracks to sign up after the collapse of the 1913 lockout. I don't know if they signed up to defend small nations or simply to try to make a living in the dire poverty of Dublin. I suspect the latter because my grandmother, Agnes Christopher's sister, was an ardent follower of Michael Collins, disliked Avalira, but never spoke of her brother's death in World War I. Indeed, in 2014, 100 years, less two, since he since he since he'd been killed in World War One, I. I was the first member of Christopher's family to visit his beautifully kept grave in Benvilliers in France. Such was the atmosphere in Dublin after the Easter Rising. Christopher's family did not officially place a death notice in the newspapers until a full year had passed. At the time Christopher met his untimely death, 21 years of age, 25,000 Dubliners alone were in the British Army fighting the Kaiser for the rights of small nations, including their own, which had been promised a grudging measure of self-determination. About 5,000 of them had already died, Dubliners, before Christopher died. But the horrific death toll in World War I was only matched by the mortality rates in Dublin. In one part of Dublin's inner city at the start of the 20th century, of every 100 children born, only 36 would still be alive 10 years later. Dublin was a sea of grinding poverty, disease and premature death of unimaginable proportions. 20 million people were killed in World War I, 10.3 million civilians and 9.7 million comp combatants. Numbers we just simply cannot comprehend. We cannot comprehend. In the Easter Rising, just under 500 were killed, and shockingly, we still don't know the exact figure. Of those killed in the Easter Rising, 54% were civilians, 30% were security forces, army and police, and 16% were Irish rebels. This beautiful and poignant memorial here in Wooden Bridge is a fitting and moving tribute to the 1,215 men and nine women residents of County Wicklow who lost their lives as soldiers, sailors, munition workers, nurses, or civilians in the Great War, as it's called, of 1914-1918. I do not underestimate the amount of work that has gone into over many years of research, campaigns, persuading, financing, designing, and erecting this everlasting memorial, which not as only is impressive to view, but historically significant in naming and locating the deceased. Unfortunately, no such memorial yet exists for the majority of people killed in the Easter Rising, civilians. Yes, rightly the leaders of the rebellion, both men and women, are remembered in nearly every city and town in this country and this county through memorials, street names, railway stations, hospitals, public buildings and parks. But the majority who died in the Easter Rising in 1916 are forgotten. Their names are not etched anywhere, and in the words of the great Sean O'Casey, commenting on the civilians killed in the Rising, he wrote, They must put up with you. You would be unknown forever. You died without a word of praise. You would be buried without even a shadowy ceremony. No bugle will call your name. No gunshot will let loose brave echoes over your grave. You will not be numbered among the accepted slain. Thankfully, no members of Cumann Amman were killed in the Easter Rising, and they are rightly commemorated. 
But we do know that 45 adult women, mostly mothers from the tenements, and six girls under 16 were killed in one single week, Easter week. 200 men who were not competent were also killed. To stand in front of this beautiful, dignified memorial on this historic spot near where John Redmond made his courageous speech in September 1914, encouraging members of the Valley Irish Volunteers to join the British Army in his words, the interests of Ireland, the whole of Ireland, are at stake in this war. And regardless of what one thinks of the politics involved on the day, this memorial invites reflection, solitude, empathy and learning. Everything that makes us human. Indeed, the only place in the world where all the civilians killed in the Easter Rising were named and memorialised in stone was on the necrology wall in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Unfortunately, after a few acts of vandalism, which as we know now, any public war can be a target for, for cheap and counterproductive publicity, the Glasnevin Trust decided to remove all the names from the wall. Today it is a sheer, blank, black wall, an ignominious standing stone to intolerance, wanton vandalism and cowardice by those who in the dead of night defaced it. It is surely the only memorial in the world to those who died in conflict that has been forcibly removed. Ironically, because of what we commemorate here today in this sacred spot in this garden county, the necrology wall emerged at the same time and independently in Ireland as the stunningly beautiful Ring of Memory in northern France, about 50 miles from where my own relative lies buried. The Ring of Memory lists alphabetically, with no distinction in rank, nationality or allegiance, the 600,000 who perished in that area in World War I. So, as Philip Close, the designer, stresses, there are no ranks, no nationalities, just a dizzying list of the human story that ended on France's northern battlefields. The name of friends and foes are engraved together in order to establish a theme of forgiveness and reconciliation after the conflict. The Ring of Memory in France has become a sacred, dignified, moving memorial, visited silently by countless thousands from across the globe. The necrology wall in Ireland is gone. Remember, literally, brother fought against brother in the birth of this nation. Gerard Nealon from Rathmines in Dublin was, like his two brothers, a member of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. But unlike my granduncle Christopher, he had not been dispatched to France. Instead, on Easter Monday 1916, on that morning, he was stationed in the Royal Barracks, now Collins Museum, in Dublin. And as they marched down the Liffey Keys in formation, believe it or not, led by an officer with his sword outstretched, Jared Nealon was shot dead by rebels. Ironically, his younger brother Anthony, a member of the Volunteers, was behind a barricade 500 yards away in Church Street. Anthony survived the rising and died in 1944. Both brothers are buried together in Glasnevin Cemetery. And if her youngest child had been killed in the Rising, even Neelan would have buried her sons together. But their names could never appear on the same memorial in 24th century Ireland. They are buried in posthumous fraternity. Can that not be the rallying call for our own memorials? In the words of the great poet Louis MacNeese in his epic poem Autumn Journal, ironically published on the eve of World War II, he asks, why do we as a country let them pigeonhole the souls of the killed into sheep and goats, patriots and traitors? I did protest at the time to the removal of the necrology wall in Glasnevin, but support, especially from those who were espousing the idea of a shared island, was not forthcoming. And I can honestly tell you I was reduced to tears when I visited Glasnevin Cemetery to see those blank, black slates with the names mostly of the forgotten children and civilians removed. Indeed, the civilians who died were not forgotten because they were never remembered in the first place. Can anyone recall any others who died violently in the formation of this state that were forgotten, 
then remembered for the first time in 2016, then forgotten again, consigned to the skip of unwritten history once again by a few acts of wanton vandalism. Before this decade of centenaries ends next year, they should be remembered. It is way beyond my influence at this stage to reinstate the necrology wall and all it stood for. But to begin with, I would like the children of this nation who died violently in the rising to be remembered in a central national location. And in an attempt to remember the 40 children who were killed that week, whose names have also been erased from the glass heaven wall, myself and eminent public sculptor Orla de Brie are campaigning for a significant public piece of art to be re re erected in memory of the children in central Dublin. Orla's design envisages a three metre high bronze piece comprising 40 young hearts, which reflect onto a three metre long bronze piece in the ground with the names, just like here, with the names of the children engraved. This piece would be lit and landscaped and an ex explanation positioned nearby. Today, we are publicly launching this campaign for a location and resources for the project. And in turn, we hope that this will lead to public memorials to the fallen heroines of 1916, the mothers of the tenements and the other 200 civilians who died. In the words of songwriter and poet Declan O'Rourke, now Pierce, now Clark, McDonough, or the Connolly would knew would, west, would rest if they were remembered on a pedestal alone. Are they not the fathers of our nation proud and free, and our sisters and our brother then, brothers then, the children of 16? This memorial in Wooden Bridge with 1,224 individual names, beautifully engraved, not just stands to the memory of those who perished. It is a testament to the people in the area, the people of Wicklow, and their quiet dignity, their tolerance, and their appreciation of our common shared humanity. It should inspire us to remember others with courage, dignity, and inclusivity. As we arrived here today, we were greeted with the etched words of Ireland's war poet, Francis Ledwidge, who was killed in World War I in Flanders Field in Belgium. He was just 29, two years older than the average age of those who were killed in that carnage. And indeed, the greatest single group killed in World War I, World War I were 19-year-olds, 19-year-olds. And the closest to 19-year-olds we have in this gathering is not here with respect, is there with our uniformed uh, scouts that are with us here today. That's how young the, the people were that were killed in, in that awful, awful war. On the spot where he was killed, Francis Ledwich is remembered, and his poem Soliloquy is inscribed, and it is with his words I wish to conclude. Tomorrow will be loud with war, how will I be accounted for? Is it too late now to retrieve a fallen dream too late to grieve? A name unmade but not too late to thank the gods for what is great. A keen aged sword, a soldier's heart is greater than the poet's art and greater than a poet's fame is a little grave that has no name. A yesterday good ever, Anna Magadilish Galer, good a meal of